let's dive in. I have to tell you, reading the book, I got about two chapters in, and I found it so relentless, and I knew there'd be more hope in the end. I cheated ahead to the last chapter. <laughs> and knowing that there's stuff we can do, knowing that everything isn't all over, I found it easier to go back and read the rest. <laughs> so I just wonder about if you knew that the, the tone can be intimidating. Uh, well, I think on purpose, because I, I, I don't share the American culture's mania for hope. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes out of spending two decades as a war correspondent. Mm -hmm. We made a very cold, calculated assessment of what the weapon systems were around us, and we responded. We also understood that so many of our victories were Pyrrhic. Uh, during the war, I covered the war in El Salvador for five years, we would often, the roads would be blocked after the Salvadoran military committed a massacre. We would have to walk in, uh, often at great danger. This was also true, uh, especially during the war in Kosovo. Uh, indeed, the Serb snipers often fired on the journalists who walked in. Um, and there was a, a sense or a feeling of euphoria when we were able to document the atrocities, that these atrocities that they had sought to hide from public view, um, these lives that they had extinguished and hoped would never be recorded, um, I was able to put on the front page of the New York Times. But it didn't mean that I wasn't gonna wake up tomorrow and have to do it all over again. Indeed, that usually was the pattern, coupled with the fact that that work was very dangerous. I mean, many of the people I worked with, the photographers and war reporters, over those two decades, including my closest friend, uh, Kurt Shork, are, are dead. They didn't make it. And I, I think that that, that, that baseline, and it, it comes somewhat out of my education as a seminarian steeped in Calvin and Niebuhr, and I, I not only have a dark view of humanity, I have a tragic view of life, um, which is very much at odds with the obsessive positive thinking of a consumer society and a commercial culture. Um, but I think it actually uh, gives you a kind of armor mm -hmm. to cope with what's happening. And just from climate change alone, things are very bleak and dangerous. And I, I think the greatest or, or perhaps hardest existential crisis of our time is to grasp reality and yet resist anyway. Um, but I, I just am not willing, and I don't think it's beneficial to give people exits mm -hmm. from how bleak it is, both in terms of what we're doing to the biosphere uh, and this concentration of wealth in the hands of the global elite. Uh, where it's not, and it's of course not just economic ramifications, 70% of this country is living paycheck to paycheck, um, but of course it has political consequences. As Karl Polanyi writes in The Great Transformation, which is his book on the nature of unfettered, unregulated capitalism, he said that you create a mafia economy, but eventually you create a mafia political system, which is of course what the Trump White House is. Mm -hmm. I, of course, am going to get into the guts of the book, but I, I'm, I'm taking the way the world has informed your view of it and the fact that you're a father. And I, I wonder h how you have those two things together, that the world is bleak and let's not do artificial hope. So what is it that you offer your children to let them get up in the morning? Well, I, ha I have younger children and older children. I'm mm -hmm. pretty frank with the older children, and, and uh, the, the younger children are certainly aware of climate change, um, but one doesn't pummel a 10-year-old right. with uh, you know, the, the uh, details of the melting of the polar ice caps and the consequences of going beyond 2% Celsius and feedback loops. and um, but I, I'm very worried, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm increasingly worried in a culture that unplugs itself from the real world. Uh, and, I, and I see within our commercial media, 
uh, a kind of walking away from responsible journalism for endless carnival, endless burlesque, mm -hmm. which is what CNN is. I mean, I come out of the old newspaper world, and the idea that uh, repeated reports or interviews with a former porn star and a lawyer who wants to run for president and a former reality television star who was in the white, I mean, this is, this is uh, it, it's just P.T. Barnum all the time. Mm. Uh, and there are extremely serious things happening around us, uh, including the debacles that we are engaged in in the Middle East, 17 years of futile and endless war, that just go unspoken. Mm -hmm. uh, there, we, don't, we don't even have a rational discussion in the mainstream uh, about the nature of corporate capitalism and how it works. Uh, and so... Um, you know, as soon as you say corporate capitalism, I think there's a large part of the populace who just said, you know, crazy liberal, old hippie, whatever. I think, I think that the very phraseology... Well, I'm neither a liberal or a hippie, so... <laughs> <laughs> but that's the impression. That's, I think that's an honest... When people say, you know, corporate capitalism... I don't know, if you say corporate capitalism to the, the farm families in the town in upstate New York where I grew up, whose farms have all been foreclosed upon and who have suffered a rash of suicides and... Um, deep economic distress. They know very well what corporate capitalism is. If you go to Anderson, Indiana, as I do in this book, and you talk to the old UAW workers who'd been in the GM plants that are now down in Monterey, Mexico, paying Mexican <laughs> workers $3 an hour without benefits, mm -hmm. uh, and their town has become a wasteland like all deindustrialized former manufacturing centers in the United States, they get corporate capitalism. Uh, I, I think the victims get it. Well, let's, let's start there. Let's start with Anderson, and it's emblematic of any number of cities sure. where it used to be based in factory work or, you know, uh, that kind of everybody goes to work together, there's a union. Right. Um, it's a company town. Completely. Anderson and, was. Yeah, and when the company goes away, you're left with people who essentially have nothing. These are some, that and the lace factory that went out, you know, which we can talk I about open as well. I opened Scranton. That Scranton's another city Scranton, like that. Scranton, Pennsylvania. When you talk to the people in those towns, what do they say about having lost, and I'm picking a point to start on, what do they say about having lost their unions that they might have expected to protect them from all this? Well, once you pass NAFTA, you open the door for GM to do what they did, mm -hmm. which is to move their plants overseas. Right. Um, that had nothing to do with the unions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the corporate managers will often seek to blame the unions uh, because uh, they were paying union workers $25, $30 an hour uh, and providing benefits. God forbid. Yeah, and a pension. And you could a support a family on one salary and you could send your kids to college, and you could own a home. Um, and they, they will argue quite correctly that, of course, it's far cheaper for them to produce vehicles in Monterey, um, but that's not the fault of the union. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the compensation packages for these corporate executives has reached utterly obscene proportions. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1950s, I think the ratio was 30 to 1 or 50 to 1 in terms of CEO worker. Uh, now it's in the hundreds, 500, 600 uh, to 1. Uh, and so the, 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 the staggering income inequality, which is the worst in American history, it is now outstripped the so-called gilded age, has not just economic consequences, but political consequences, mm -hmm. as every political theorist going back to Aristotle understood. And, and, it, 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 I, and I, I go back to the former Yugoslavia, I was the Balkan bureau chief for the New York Times. The economic collapse of Yugoslavia vomited up these political monstrosities like Radovan Karadzic, Slobodan Milosevic, Franjo Tuzman, uh, who, like Trump, ridiculed in the, with the same kind of vulgarity and also, I should mention, the same incitement to violence and the same racism, mm 
uh, they uh, ridiculed an established elite that was ineffectual in terms of dealing with the legitimate grievances and suffering of the mass of the population. Mm -hmm. And that, that, is, that was Trump's success in that however crude and, and repugnant he was and is, he nevertheless expressed a, a rage, and I would say a legitimate rage, on the part of, in particular, the white working class towards the elites like the Jeb Bushes or the uh, Bill and Hillary Clintons who betrayed them. Uh, and, uh, and they did betray them. Why did that message resonate when we're talking about a guy with whom, you know, everything is gilded? Everything, you know, um, everything is very high end. Everything is all about, you know, this well, is very... I wouldn't say it high end, I'd say it's tacky. This, okay. It's very tacky. <laughs> I guess it is tacky. But I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand why a messenger like that is someone you would, be, you would believe about the elite. Well, because in, in moments of political distress, this opens the door for demagogues and con artists. And all of those political figures I just named in Yugoslavia were demagogues and con artists. Mm -hmm. they, they tell people what they want to hear. Um, the, 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 the power of Trump, as Matt Taibbi, I think, has pointed out correctly, is that reality for him is delivered through a television screen. And in that sense, he's completely connected with, unfortunately, a large percentage of the American public, mm -hmm. for whom the television screen is the lens by which they interpret and understand the world around them. So uh, Trump, like all celebrities, has a manufactured personality. We know from his business record that he was pretty much of a disaster as a business person, uh, multiple bankruptcies, uh, he defrauded his investors, he uh, refused to pay his contractors, especially in Atlantic City, many of whom went bankrupt. Um, and so he goes on a reality television show and they create this fictional persona of him as this business titan. Uh, and then he uses this fictional persona to sell himself uh, to the presidency. Um, but all of this comes through television. All of this comes through make-believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the ability to deliver these electronic hallucinations in 24-hour streams and handheld devices, we are, as uh, I think it was... Uh, Neil Gabler wrote, probably the most illusioned society on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, because all of this is constructed, it's not real. It, it's interesting to me that we're already getting a slew of questions about how to talk to people with whom you donors have. For example, I remember during the election, there was a slew of people who said, how can you look at Trump and not get his business record? How can you look and not get his inauthenticity? And that's, to me, where the divide really started making itself evident betwe between the people who could have benefited by looking at the corporate underpinnings of everything that was happening. Instead, you had Trump, and we didn't understand why they didn't look at Trump the way we did. A lot of people are asking about how you talk to someone who's that far apart from well, you. Well, I, I, would, I would say that those who have are part of the... Uh, in particular white elite who live in places like Menlo Park have the luxury of uh, dismissing Trump. Mm -hmm. But when you're desperate, when the established elites of the two main political parties have lied to you successively over years and betrayed you and destroyed your family and destroyed your community and extinguished your hope and thrust you into despair. And the highest, when I write about suicide in the book, the highest rates of suicide in the United States are middle-aged white men. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the lies of the uh, Republican and Democratic Party establishment were slicker, were more carefully packaged, were delivered in a tone of reasonableness. Um, and the lies of a Trump are crude and vulgar. Uh, but there is a desperation 
I mean, this is, you know, I tra as you know, I traveled all over the country for this, from Utah to Scranton to, you know, s s at one point actually literally sitting around a bonfire in upstate New York near Binghamton with white hate groups praying that, that none of them would Google me. Um, <laughs> Which didn't always work because you had your contact information exposed. You've been attacked from a lot of angles, you know, people talking about whether you were um, engaging in plagiarism. I mean, there are a lot of personal Well, let's, let's just, if you want to bring that up, I mean, the person who made that charge is the head of anarchists for Trump. Well, that's what I'm saying, I mean, is that you were... <laughs> I mean, you can find anything you want on the Internet. Understood, but that's part of what I'm saying is that to... If you have someone who is speaking something that they don't want to hear, they being anyone that you're, that you're exposing, then there are ways to go after you personally right. well, that disturb the message. Sure, and, and the New York Times just reviewed this novel, and the whole column is about me, and, uh, largely, mm -hmm. and not at all about the novel. And they did to me just what the New Yorker did to Glenn Greenwald, which is to paint you as messianic and angry. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that becomes a way to um, marginalize, if not delegitimize, what it is you're writing about. And mm -hmm. I, I would just, for the record, I admire Glenn quite a bit. So that's, that's standard. And uh, I, I think that part of the reason that uh, a, a, an establishment liberal organization like the New Yorker goes after someone like Greenwald or would go after someone like me is because we call out the hypocrisy of the liberal class. Um, and y you end up not having many friends at all when you are critiquing the establishment, whether the establishment, the establishment, uh, the Democratic or the Republican establishment. And I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite fierce on both. So um, that, you know, inevitably makes you a very lonely, isolated, and often uh, a uh, reviled figure, but that's the price of, in, at least from my perspective, that's the price of trying to be as honest as you can. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you know, uh, you know, we, I, I went to Harvard Divinity School, but I lived in a housing project in Roxbury uh, for two and a half years, uh, or actually crossed the street from the Mission Main Mission Extension Housing Project and ran a church there. And I always say that uh, the two and a half years I lived in Roxbury is learned when I learned to really hate liberals. Um, all of those people at Harvard who liked the poor but didn't like the smell of the poor, who sat around talking about empowering people they never met. So um, this, which, going back to your earlier question, this knee-jerk response that you're a liberal, uh, or, you know, that, that, that just becomes a way to uh, attach a particular label, in this case completely incorrect, a particular label to you uh, and then use that label to uh, essentially shut down what it is you have to say. And that's a very standard technique. I mean, when I denounced the war in Iraq, uh, for which I had a clash with my then employer, the New York Times, um, the Wall Street Journal ran an editorial calling me a liberal pacifist. Well, I'm not a pacifist. I was in Sarajevo during the war mm -hmm. uh, when we were being hit with 2,000 shells a day. And uh, I, like everyone else in Sarajevo, understood that uh, if you did not man the trench system, it was literally a trench system around the city, uh, the Serbs would break through and slaughter a third of the population and push the rest into displacement and refugee camps. Uh, and we, that wasn't conjecture. That's what they did in the Drina Valley. It's what they did in Vukovar. It doesn't save you from the poison of violence. But, I mean, this was just a way to... And I, I mean, I'd also been the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times uh, for seven, and speak Arabic and was there seven years. These were informed decisions, but by using those labels, it becomes a way to dismiss what it is you have to say. That's in line with one of our audience questions. Is there ever a place or necessity for violence, even to protect our children from disastrous leadership? Um, there are moments when uh, there are forces, and the Serb forces surrounding Sarajevo would be a good example of that, where those forces seek the annihilation of, of potentially your family and yourself, and um, you are faced with that awful choice of having to pick up a weapon. Mm 
um, and I, my first book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, is an attempt to uh, explain the culture of war um, and the danger of using violence. I mean, the people who first organized the defenses in Sarajevo uh, were largely came out of the criminal class. They were people who had access to weapons and a penchant for violence. And when they weren't holding back the Serbs, they were looting the apartments of the ethnic Serbs who had remained behind, and in some cases, not only stealing everything they had, but killing them. Um, that's the, the, the dark world you are sucked into once you employ violence, even in a supposedly just cause. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I covered the war in El Salvador. Uh, in, there were peaceful, huge peaceful marches in San Salvador, the capital, and the uh, military and the police set up uh, machine guns on the roofs and fired into the crowds. Well, that made peaceful d resistance impossible, and we got this tragic civil war. B but it's always the oppressor who determines the response. Um, and when the oppressor or those in power refuse over a long period of time to, uh, to heed the cries of the oppressed, and they use harsher and harsher forms of control, then they provoke counterviolence. Let's go into some of the areas of escape and decay that you look at. And I'm picking out some of the chapter headings to give us an entree. Heroin, work, sadism, hate, gambling, and then, of course, chapter seven, the last chapter, we'll talk about freedom. Heroin's an interesting one because it starts out as something of an escape. And then, of course, once you're addicted, there you are. Uh, we've seen so much death. Deaths have almost doubled since 2006. And I think that it might be a surprise to some people to look at that and see corporate underpinnings there. Can you explain how corporations are there? And in fact, if you'd like to respond to that story I mentioned about what the Purdue Pharma exec is doing now, which is... Well, th this is the Sackler family who are the largest drug pushers in the country and have made billions off of uh, addicting uh, hundreds of thousands, if not a few million Americans, uh, by pushing heroin derivatives, Oxycontin, uh, and setting up doctor, uh, doctors are complicit in setting up pill mills. Where do these pill mills, where are they set up? Well, they're not set up in Menlo Park, and they're not set up in Princeton, where I live. Uh, they are set up in places that uh, are suffering deep economic dislocation and despair, of course, um, southern West Virginia. Um, and uh, these pills were given, I mean, you had a back ache, suddenly you got a heroin derivative, you got Oxycontin, uh, Percocet. And uh, they're highly addictive, uh, and they're expensive, and eventually you turn to heroin because it's cheap, $6 a bag. Um, and the bags are now often laced with fentanyl, uh, and they kill you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, which oddly makes the heroin more attractive to some of the consumers. Yeah, if yeah, if yeah. you have a death from fentanyl, then you have a group of addicts who are going now. There, I, 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 I wrote about it in the book. Yeah, which surprised me. Like they all, uh, it's death by marketing. So somebody dies of an overdose, uh, and everybody wants that. Ba all these bags have names, you know, I don't know, Red Star or something. So they all want it. I mean, it's just kind of nuts, but it shows you how perverse that world is. And heroin, uh, there's a book, Dreamland, uh, I forget the author, quite, it's quite good, which I read. Um, and he, in there, he writes about how that arrow, the molecules of heroin, it doesn't, le it can't wash it out of your body. So a year later, you can uh, feel as if you're dope sick, even though you've been clean for a year. It's a really pernicious drug. Um, and that's what makes what the Sackler family did through Purdue Pharma so criminal. There's an interesting point you make about that is when rats get an extra dose of opi opioids, they increase their play with each other. They even tickle each other. When rodents are allowed to socialize free freely rather than remain isolated in steel cages, they voluntarily avoid the opiate-laden bottle hanging from right. the bars of their cage. They've already got enough. Yeah. How, what does that tell us about the humans in Well, this it rat tells race? us that our, you know, and, and the, the model for this book is really Durkheim's study of suicide, the breakdown of 
of social bonds, Durkheim found, led to a desire for self-annihilation. Uh, and as Durkheim understood, that lust to commit death is at its core about self-annihilation. Mm. So you see it in these nihilistic mass shootings. I write about Dylan Roof, of course, and quote, because Dylan Roof left a written record. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a, I think, a very revealing study for what's happened, the social decay, uh, the, what Durkheim calls the anomie, uh, that has propelled people into activities that are deeply self-destructive. So the book is about those pathologies. I mean, gambling, for instance, and I didn't know a lot about it um, until uh, I spent time in the Trump Taj Mahal before Trump even announced he was going to be president. Uh, and, 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 and it was it had gone through several bankruptcies. Uh, there were rodents literally running across the dining room floors. Uh, you went into the bathrooms and they had plastic bags over the urinals of the toilets saying out of order. The, the, the tiles were falling off. The, there was mold in the ceiling. Uh, many of the rooms have been mothballed. It was kind of a wonderful image for what he's going to do to the country. Um, <laughs> And uh, and what was and and uh, Schuld, uh, uh, a professor at NYU, wrote "Addicted by Design," a very fine book, where she w worked with the industry about how um, eighty percent of gambling is done on slots, and these slots replicate the kind of zombie-like state that one gets when they take uh, a depressant like heroin. Mm -hmm. um, people, it's called time on device, and the, and the way they monitor these people, I mean, many of the tactics in terms of uh, building profiles uh, that now the security and surveillance state, uh, and thank you Google and Facebook, I should say, for are complicit in this, uh, build on uh, about us, were pioneered within the casino industry because they wanted to, I mean, they did, they, they built projections as to how much addicted gamblers would actually spend during their lifetimes. Um, w you know, they could trace when they would get frustrated, they would show up and give them free coupons while they're sitting at that slot machine uh, to, to keep them. Um, and and uh, uh, gambling addicts actually have the highest rates of attempted suicide or suicide of any addiction. So, but, it, but it replicates the many other forms of addiction which are really about uh, unplugging yourself from uh, from the world around you because reality has become so difficult to bear. There was only one place in the book that I was reading that I, 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 I felt in it a strong disagreement with you. When you were talking about prostitution uh, and you interviewed some women who are activists against prostitution, you also interviewed some women who were frankly victimized by prostitution, the only thing that rang wrong to me is the dismissing of women who say that they are voluntarily making a living and okay with being in prostitution, with okay with being paid for sex. And the difficulty I had with that was there was, well, the women who are saying that don't realize they've been victimized, they don't realize the, the psychology that's going on. And I feel women are told an awful lot that they're wrong about the truth they express about themselves. That when they state their reality, someone said, well, if you, were, if you were more keyed in, you understand that what you're saying isn't true. That was the only thing that hit me wrong. Well, first of all, statistically, we know that most of the women who engage in, and I'm actually writing about a very extreme form of prostitution. I'm writing about the BDSM community out of kink.com in San Francisco, which is torture. I mean, there's just no other way around it. I took classes at uh, kink.com uh, sitting in a basement room with a bunch of doms, you know, kind of dweeby guys dressed in black. Uh, um, and we know statistically that a huge percentage of these women were sexually abused, often as children. Um, uh, I've interviewed enough of them, and I, my lo longest chapter in Empire of Illusion is on the porn industry to know that it was uh, economic uh, distress that push them uh, into this industry. Also, it's uh, the PTSD. When I first started interviewing uh, women who had been in the porn industry, I, I remember the first interview I did and they started speaking, I instantly recognized 
the PTSD that I carried from 20 years of war. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the first point. The second point is that the vast majority of women who in, are, are prostituted, uh, are, it's not, uh, what was that movie, Pretty Woman with Julia Roberts? It's not like that. Right. They're, they're usually women of color. Uh, and if you go to Europe, they're all uh, women of color or women from Eastern Europe who are trafficked. And um, I, I do break with the left. I mean, you talk about being a liberal. I mean, this is not a liberal belief, but it's one that I hold, actually, that um, we have to decriminalize the act of prostitution, i.e., the women are not the criminals, uh, but the traffickers and the uh, the pimps and you know these figures are should be criminalized and the customers and customers and John. So uh, I think that's a very rational model. I think it's compassionate to the women. But the point is that we should be building a society whereby that is not the only economic alternative a woman has. And as you know, I quote Rachel Moran, mm -hmm. who was a prostituted woman in Ireland for many years. And she's quite graphic about describing having sex with repugnant men who she doesn't want to have, as she calls it, being raped for a living. Uh, and uh, yes, there are very vocal voices in the quote unquote sex industry, uh, but I would encourage people to look at where the money's coming from uh, mm -hmm. that funds that industry. Uh, m most of the women that I sought out who had been in the prostitution industry or in the porn industry, they don't want to talk. Um, it, you know, they suffer the same kind of trauma, well, it's not the same, but a similar form of trauma that those of us who come out of war suffered. Uh, and so uh, I, I would also add, you know, as a war correspondent, the only thing that wars produce in greater number than corpses are prostitutes. Mm -hmm. um, these are uh, widows, women, uh, oh, girls in refugee camps. I mean, prostitution was endemic in every war that I covered. Um, and it gets into the commodification of human beings, you know, that, that of course the natural world is a commodity that we're destroying, but also under corporate capitalism, human beings are commodities that we exploit. Uh, and as somebody who sees with intrinsically in every form of life, uh, and not just human life, uh, the sacred, um, I, 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 this is just something I can't, I can't support. Let's move over to the alt-right and the alt-light, and how one serves essentially as an entree to the other. Right. So Trump is kind of the alt-light. Uh, you know, there's good people on both sides. <laughs> uh, but it funnels people into the alt-right, which is kind of that spectral figure of Stephen Miller um, in the White House. Uh, so it it normalizes and maybe legitimizes um, racism, uh, as we said before, incitement to violence. Uh, it has the uh, effect of demonizing um, the vulnerable. And in proto-fascist or fascist societies, it's the vulnerable who pay. I mean, the whole idea that 11 million undocumented workers, most of whom are from Mexico and Central America, are at fault for the economic uh, decline of the United States is patently absurd. Mm -hmm. um, but as things devolve and we are headed for another economic crisis, the New York Times four or five days ago had a very chilling editorial that said this, and they had an article uh, a week ago about how the fracking industry would be the next dot bomb, dot com, crash because it's on projected profits. It's not actually on earn. In fact, the fracking industry loses tremendous amounts of money. So, uh, and in a moment of instability, uh, then you have already mainstreamed Islamophobia. You've already mainstreamed racism, attacks against poor people of color, uh, and uh, the elites, and this goes back to Yugoslavia, will then use and d or direct that rage towards the vulnerable uh, and allow this incohate uh, anger to express itself through violence. 
uh, as if these people are somehow responsible. And, and you know, the, 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 uh, one of the things that disturbs me, there are two things that disturb me uh, particularly about Trump. One is uh, the uh, poisoning of civil discourse, mm -hmm. but also uh, w w that, that characteristic which I write about in the book of the permanent lie, which is different. All politicians lie. I, I was a reporter. They all lie. There's no yeah. exception. Obama lies. Clinton, they all lie. But Clinton, who sold us NAFTA, uh, and sold us NAFTA by promising that it would mean millions more good American jobs, doesn't continue to tell us that NAFTA produced millions of good American jobs. The permanent lie which Trump engages in, and which all demagogues, all dictators, all totalitarian systems engage in, is spouted regardless of reality. Reality doesn't, the fo you know, we're just watching how they fix the fig uh, pictures. You know, we had the Park Service edit the pictures mm -hmm. of the inauguration. Reality doesn't make, doesn't, and that's extremely dangerous. Hannah Arendt writes about it in Origins of Totalitarianism because it's what you see in front of you is being denied by the megaphone. Mm -hmm. And it creates a, a kind of schizophrenia. Um, and unfortunately, we are a society awash in fake news, which doesn't come out of Moscow. It comes out of Fox News. It comes out of Breitbart. It comes out of these, I mean, the whole idea that Fox News is now considered a legitimate journalistic enterprise is staggering and well, frightening. Well, Britain treat, treats Fox News as unreliable and not a legitimate news well, outlet. Well, of course, it's unreliable and it's a, it's a piece, it's propaganda. Well, you're, you're on RT, which is yes. a Russian news outlet. Yes. It could be taken as a conflict of interest to say that you know, Russia is not a fake news machine. Well, I didn't say Russia wasn't a fake news machine. I, all governments, I, I don't trust any government, including the Russian government. I mean, I'm not discriminating here. But if you are an anti-capitalist and an anti-imperialist critic, mm -hmm. you have nowhere to go anymore. And so... Uh, I, I know very well why RT allows my show. It's the same reason Voice of America put Václav Havel on during the communist regime. Havel, who I was in the Magic Lantern Theater every night in Prague during the Velvet Revolution with Havel, was a socialist. He didn't support American imperialist adventurism in Vietnam or anywhere else, but he had nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And this is about the corruption of our media platforms, and in particularly our public television. If you went back to the 1960s on public television, you could see Malcolm X, Noam Chomsky, our greatest intellectual, who's yeah. been completely uh, blacklisted. Yes. Uh, Howard Zinn, James Baldwin. And now, because they've slashed the funding, because PBS is dependent on corporate donations, like NPR, it's uh, uh, the the it, it's this constriction of acceptable opinion, and of course you know the Koch brothers are big investors in public broadcasting. Now, of course, they're destroying the crown jewel of American democracy, which is called public education, and uh, that constriction has left us without a vocabulary to understand the class warfare that is being waged against us by a global, corporate, oligarchic, and I would argue criminal class. Mm -hmm. um, and that's by intent. And so the, the, the elites understand that, and this is across the political spectrum, there, nobody's buying their ideology of global capitalism, globalization, neoliberalism, whatever you want to call it. Nobody's buying it. They're not buying it on the right, they're not buying it on the left. And so the elites have, have gone after, over the last year, those critics of corporate capitalism and imperialism who already exist on the margins of the internet. Mm -hmm. And how have they done that? Well, Google, Facebook have imposed algorithms that block those people out. So I write a column every Monday for tr the website Truth Dig, run by Robert Shear, one of the great American journalists, former editor of Ramparts. And, uh, and so it, it, they have what they call impressions. So if you'd gone to Google and you typed uh, let's say imperialism, and I had recently written a story on imperialism or column, then it would be there with other. 
Now it's not there. And so we've watched at Truth Dig alone the referrals from imperialism uh, decline over the last 12 months from 700,000 to below 200,000 as they perfect the algorithms. All of the sites, Black Agenda Report, Counterpunch, Alternet, which has lost 63% of its traffic, World Socialist Website, 80-something percent of its traffic. Couple that with net, the abolition of net neutrality, and what they've done is uh, further push their critics uh, from reaching the public because they have no credibility left. And that loss of credibility is what led to the insurgency in the Democratic Party with Sanders, and it's what led to the insurgency in the Republican Party with Trump. Uh, and the elites are kind of scrambling. You uh, have to tip your hat, though, to the right, because when they started being blackballed from some of the websites, there was a strong unified response that said, you know, you're shadow banning us, you're taking our right to speak. It was an impressive display of a unified message, whether it was accurate or not, they knew how to play that Well, card. there was a unified message among those of us on the left, but we don't have any money. We don't have the most retrograde forces of American capitalism, like the Mercers, bankrolling us. I have to poke at you a little bit, because I, I looked at your section about taking money from foundations and how much that can endanger a message, but then in your acknowledgments, you thanked a foundation. Well, I did. I thanked the Wallace Action Fund, um, which is about as left-wing as you can get, <laughs> number one, and number two, probably about the only foundation that would, and they didn't, they gave me $25,000 for a research assistant. We're not talking about, w w I wasn't wallowing in cash there. <laughs> you haven't cashed that Soros check, have you? <laughs> no, Soros wouldn't give me money. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about, in fact, you were talking about the politicians and some of the changes that have been coming within the uh, Republican and Democratic Party. Folks in the audience are asking, what do we make of the rise of populism and democratic socialism? And you actually say in the book that even though there's some encouraging people coming up, they still will be compromised because they're politicians. Sure, well, every politician's compromised. I mean, that's the poison of power, and that's why movements are absolutely vital. Um, and our movements, the movements that protected the American working class, have been destroyed, in particular labor unions. Uh, we, we go back and look at the history of the United States, uh, and the United States was founded as a closed system for male, uh, aristocratic, slaveholding elites. And it has been a long fight since the founding of our country uh, to open up democratic space, and many Americans have paid, with it, paid for it with their lives. Uh, we had hundreds of American workers murdered by gun thugs, uh, Pinkertons, Baldwin Felts, state militias, state police like Pennsylvania, who were called the Pennsylvania Cossacks. Um, and they gave us uh, the eight-hour workday. Uh, they ended child labor, the minimum wage. M and uh, we see saw it in the struggle for civil rights by African Americans. We saw it with the suffragists. Um, it's been a battle. And those movements uh, have quite consciously been targeted and destroyed. Um, we saw the Powell Memo in 1971, the attack on the free enterprise system, where uh, the business interests uh, reacted to what the political scientist Samuel Huntington called the excess of democracy um, by uh, making war uh, and by seizing control of the, the press the major political parties, academia. Uh, I mean, go into an economics department in any uh, major university and find me a Marxist economist. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Marxist, actually, but Marx's analysis of capital is probably unsurpassed. I don't buy his solution, which is, I think, utopian. Uh, so. Um, Richard Wolff's radio program is very good for uh, economics. E yeah, uh, he's great. And, uh, and, and that analysis is almost impossible to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly within the mainstream, it is impossible to hear. Right. He's on Pacifica, naturally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been on a show. Um, let's talk about trying to decide who it is that we can partner with if we're going to save the country, if we're going to form alliances. Uh, you talked about the Industrial Areas Foundation, which I had not heard of before. That's and the that old Saul Alinsky Foundation. Yes. And you're talking about people who come together who may not otherwise merge on thoughts. They're, sure. you know, um, 
people who come out of churches going with people who are atheists, but they all recognize a common need. Well, that's the point. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I'm very opposed to writing off as irredeemable or deplorable Trump supporters. Um, I've been in, you know, in Anderson, most of these old UAW workers, they voted for Sanders, but in the general election, they voted for Trump. They weren't going to vote for Clinton, not after NAFTA. Impossible. And uh, maybe it comes from my stock, of a small town, Maine, where most of my relatives held political views which were pretty repugnant and drove around literally with gun racks. And, but, but it gave me a window into their struggles. Um, and the only way that we're going to advance is to build coalitions around major economic issues. I mean, if you went into a Walmart and said, I'm here to organize, I mean, Walmart, the, uh, the Walmart family, the Waltons would never allow you to even get in Walmart. I mean, there's the great union busting corporation of America. But if you could get into a Walmart and said, we're here to organize for $15 minimum wage, uh, you would certainly have people of various political persuasions who would, would join you in that cause. And I think with that uh, we have to, I, I, I am very critical, as you know, of the politics of multiculturalism and uh, identity politics divorced from economic justice. Uh, and I think that, you know, there was, I think it was Lord Salisbury who said, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no permanent alliances, only permanent power. Mm -hmm. Uh, was certainly was how Saul Alinsky worked in Chicago. Uh, we have to organize around issues that affect the lives of working men and women and the poor uh, and, uh, y you know, who they voted for, if they voted, uh, w you know, whatever. I mean, I think we have a right to ask them to respect everyone around them. Um, uh, but we're only going to build significant change by making these alliances not falling into the trap of the class divide, by splitting the working classes uh, along uh, uh, racial uh, you know, or ideological lines. That serves the interests of, of the oligarchs. Doesn't that turn a little bit problematic? I'm thinking specifically of when Bernie Sanders was on the trail and there were some Black Lives Matter activists who got up at one of his rallies and said, you're not listening. We're being shot in the street. You can talk about giving us more jobs. You can talk about, you know, making more money available to us. Right now we're being killed and need to focus on that. And I think that when you put the blanket of identity politics on that, it can sound, especially from a white guy, kind of dismissive. Well, I, I don't look at the Black Lives Matter movement as identity politics at all. Forgive me, I misunderstood that. I, I, I'm talking about uh, places like Princeton, where I teach. You, because when you said racism, I thought you just well, put it in the same... Well, uh, no. I'm, I'm a strong... I write in the book. I'm a strong supporter in the last chapter of the Black Lives right. Movement. Uh, and in fact, in matter of fact, interview activists from Ferguson, uh, mm -hmm. who I admire immensely. Yes. Um, no, they're responding to police terror, police murder, uh, which happens in marginal communities every single day in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have done so with immense courage. Uh, and I will also add that I found Bernie Sanders, especially at the beginning of his campaign, tone deaf on the issue of race and racial violence. I teach in a prison, so mm, yes. I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I see up close uh, what we have done to poor people of color. Um, the, our system of mass incarceration, uh, which is one of the great human rights violations of the industrial world, 25% of the world's prison population, we are 5% of the world's prison population, 94% of these people never even had a jury trial. This is about social control. It is about, uh, and, and we saw it, and Clinton, you know, go back to the 1994 omnibus crime bill where he pumped $300 uh, uh, million dollars into the prison system, uh, expanded the prison population from about 700,000 to 2 million. Um, you, you, you left deindustrialized pockets. Uh, y there was no hope for them to make a living within the legal economy. Um, they're not producing money for the corporations on the streets of these industrial wastelands, but you lock them in a cage and they can produce fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year for the prison contractors, for Armark, which runs the food service, for 
global tell link, which uh, has these horrible four to five times uh, what our phone rates are, and, and that makes me extremely uh, angry because for uh, children, the only way they can have contact with their parents, incarcerated parent, is through the telephone, uh, the privatization of uh, medical services, uh, um, JPay, money transfer. There, it's a billion, billions in terms of predatory activity. And Dostoevsky says, if you want to understand the heart of a society, look in their prisons. Look what they do to the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And now we have almost a million prisoners who work for for-profit corporations. And there are cities and counties that tell prisons, if you build here, we'll keep the cages full. Yeah, well, they do. They, and they do keep. And their lobbyists pass laws uh, to keep recidivism rates over 60%. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people say the system doesn't work. That's wrong. The system works exactly the way it's designed to work. And we just uh, have had uh, this uh, prison work stoppage, commissary boycott, even hunger strikes within the system because they fully understand uh, that the only way to end slavery, and we're talking about states like Georgia where people work 40 hours a week for nothing or they work for 20 cents an hour, uh, is to stop being a slave. Because if you, if you paid the minimum wage within prisons, and you don't have to under the 13th Amendment, the prison system would not be sustainable. It would just be economically too costly to sustain. So uh, you look at marginal communities, you've stripped people of their rights, you engage in police terror, um, and it, they replicate the condition of the stateless, which Hannah Arendt writes about. And she said the danger is that when you have a, a section of your society who can be stripped of their rights, in essence, rights become privileges, then in a moment of unrest or instability, you have both a legal and a physical mechanism by which everyone can be stripped of their rights. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, just from a, a kind of human point of view, uh, I'm incensed at what we do to the poor, and in particular, poor people of color, but also as somebody who has covered disintegrating societies, uh, I'm frightened uh, by the normalization including lethal police force. I mean, an average of 3.3 Americans, almost all of whom are unarmed, are murdered by police in the streets of our city every day. Uh, and if you think it won't affect us, then you don't know anything about history. Right. You quote Malcolm X. I found this to be a very interesting quote. Don't run around trying to make friends with someone who's depriving you of your rights. They're not your friends. No, they're your enemies. Treat them like that. Fight them, and you'll get your freedom. After you get your freedom, your enemy will respect you. I say that with no hate. I don't have hate in me. I don't have any hate. I've got some sense. I'm not going to let anyone who hates me tell me to love him. The reason that's particularly intriguing is we talk about the corporate, the elite, the people who have all the power and all the money benefiting when we fight amongst ourselves, when the lower classes fight amongst themselves. And it's easy to look at the people who want to ban abortion, who are doing the preppers and anticipate that, you know, they're going to have to shoot everyone. It's easy to look at them and say, that's the person who hates me. That's the person who I don't want to be friends with. So make that distinction for us with Malcolm X's quote. Well, Malcolm understood the nature of power. And, uh, you know, I do come out of a divinity school background, and power is the problem. And so, uh, when people wield power to carry out acts of radical evil, when they seek to extinguish life, and they are, through the fossil fuel industry, seeking to extinguish life for all of us and our children, then um, one has to react exactly the way Malcolm pointed out. Um, but. I, I admire Malcolm X quite a bit, and uh, I, I think Malcolm was, uh, like Martin Luther King, uh, one of our great prophets. Uh, and uh, um, I mean, Malcolm wrote about white Southerners, mm -hmm. and he actually had a great quote where he said, uh, you know, I'd rather have a white Southerner call me the N-word than deal with a white liberal. Um, uh, Malcolm got power completely, as did King, you know, and, and when King moved on at the end of the civil rights movement towards economic justice, those white liberals walked out on him. 
He was all alone. Mm -hmm. uh, because, yes, they could handle desegregation. But as King and Malcolm understood, there would never be racial justice in this country until there was economic justice, which means reparations. Um, and the inability on the part of the white ruling elites to face the monstrous crime against humanity that they carried out in order to enrich this country, both against Native Americans and African Americans, has created the mythical version of America and, and American virtues and American innocence that is embodied in the face of Donald Trump. I want to go back to the fact that so many of our audience members are asking about how you talk to people with whom you have opposing views. And I'm thinking about the person that you interviewed in the book whose view of, I can imagine what he'd say about reparations, but the, the way that black people portray how many people get attacked, that there's actually more black on white crime, um, that people who didn't own slaves or slaves were happy, slaves were sad when their masters died. And I'm- Well, that was Dylan Roof, but- yeah. <laughs> but it's an attitude that's out there. I mean, this sure. is, how would you, subtracting Dylan Roof, how would you talk to someone when you're trying to explain, for example, reparations, when you're trying to talk about the generational loss with something slightly? Well, you, you, you can't speak to people who are not uh, engaged in the real world. I spent two years writing a book on the Christian right mm -hmm. called American Fascists, the Christian Right, and the war in America, and I didn't actually use the word fascist lightly. I look at them as Christian heretics. They have fused the iconography and language of the Christian religion uh, with uh, the iconography and language of the state, which is fascism for me. Um, they are not about love, they are about hate. Um, they are biblical, they s are selective literalists. They don't actually know the Bible. I mean, when I was with them, I was always upfront about where I came from. And as soon as they realized that I grew up in the church, my father was a Presbyterian minister, and I was a graduate of Harvard, they never wanted to talk th about the Bible with me. They were too frightened. Uh, because they only know what they were fed that buttressed their peculiar ideology. Mm -hmm. So you're never gonna argue someone like that out of creationism. It isn't gonna happen. And the reason is because the real world, the world out there, the world uh, where magic Jesus wasn't watching out for them, almost destroyed them. And the stories in that book are also heartbreaking. Uh, and, they, and I was moved by them. So your substance abuse, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, uh, unemployment, evictions, I mean, their lives were just uh, ripped apart by the disintegration of their communities, their families, and the economic uh, blockages that prevented them from uh, reaching their hopes and aspirations. And I came at the end of that book to the conclusion that we're not gonna, you're, we're not gonna argue them out mm -hmm. of any of that. Um, the only way to blunt that movement, which I wrote that book 10 years ago, which has now gotten worse because these Christian fascists are rapidly filling the ideological vacuum around Donald Trump, uh, is to reintegrate them into the economy. And so you ask how to speak to them, I sat for hours and interviewed them about their lives, about what they suffered, about what they endured, about, and, and those stories engendered in me a very real and legitimate empathy, and they felt it. And the other thing is I never ever, and this comes out of being a reporter for many years, I, I'm always completely honest with the people I interview. I never pretend to be something I'm not. I never use a pseudonym. and. Uh, when I did the Christian right, they knew I came out of the liberal church. They knew I went to Harvard Divinity School. And I think that when you have that kind of honesty coupled with the capacity for empathy, you can actually have meaningful conversations. Uh, and what was interesting is that there were people in that book on the Christian right whose worldview was almost diametrically opposed to mine, but who, who who afterwards contacted me because I had told their stories with compassion and respect. Mm. Uh, and so I think that when you ask how we speak to them, we speak to them about their suffering and 
we empathize with that suffering and that is the start of a relationship and we grasp that they have retreated into a form of magical thinking out of despair and that trying to dissuade them of that magical thinking rips down the last protective cover they have. And so um, I, I didn't pretend that I believed in creationism and yet I didn't try and argue them out of the idea that in six days God created all living beings including T-Rex who was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, <laughs> which you know they believe. I mean, right. and if you go to the Creationist Museum in Peterborough, Kentucky, they have a T-Rex with a saddle on it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's funny in here, but when you're sitting there with 40 people and believe it, it's not funny, it's chilling. And the guide is saying, well, I know you all wonder why T-Rex had such big teeth. It's because Adam and Eve used T-Rex to open the coconuts. <laughs> I mean, but that shows you how, how, uh, how they've disengaged with the real world. And that is, anthropologists call it crisis cults. You saw it with a ghost dance in 1890. That is a characteristic of every society. None of us are immune from it. Uh, but it is a symptom of a society in deep, deep distress. I didn't realize till I read your book that there are Silicon Valley preppers. That even at the highest uh, yeah, echelons, there are sure. people preparing um, for let, the end. Let's not get started on Silicon Valley. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the well, great, great, great enabler of the security and surveillance state. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, we're too short on the time, but we promised we would get into some of your last chapter. <laughs> I enjoyed this from one of the audience members. Okay, I haven't read the last chapter of the book. What can be done? Okay, we're getting into that. Talk about Burdock House. So I, we have to regain communities that have been destroyed to pit power against power. We have to build alternative systems that sever us from the tentacles of corporate power. Um, we have to turn off our electronic hallucinations. Um, you know, if you are sitting alone in your room, furiously writing on your computer screen, um, you know, some diatribe against state authority, you are uh, doing just what the state wants, which is sitting alone in your room in front of a computer screen. Um, we have to build relationships. The only way relationships can be built, and that's face to face. Um, the fact that I had real relationships with members of the Christian, not the leaders who are, you know, the, the, these people who run these mega churches, they, they are they're all like Trump. People say, how can the Christian right, you know, ally with Trump? And that gives the Christian right a morality it doesn't have. These mega church pastors, I mean, even in terms of sexual proclivities, they're doing things Trump never dreamed of. Uh, so, and they're making money off of people's despair, which is how Trump made his money. So, uh, they're, they're complete, they're, they're two peas in a pod. They're the same. They're, they're, um, but the fact that I could have relationships and what we have to build those relationships. And that comes with listening. It comes with empathy. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, you know, I was quite upfront if they made a particular comment about a racial group or homosexuals. I, I didn't let it pass. But it doesn't mean you can't have, and if we don't rebuild those relationships, and if we don't rebuild structures to pit power against power, then in the next financial crash, which is coming, um, and, and moment of instability, um, they will play us in a very frightening way. I mean, Trump is not a product of just our decayed political system. Boris Johnson, Orban, and Hungary, it's happening throughout the industrialized world where the wreckage of neoliberalism has destroyed uh, has concentrated wealth in the hands of the oligarchic class and destroyed democratic institutions. And we are watching Betsy DeVos destroy public education. And why? Because the Department of Education spends $63 uh, uh, billion dollars a year on education and the hedge funds want it. And they're going to get it. Uh, I mean, the pillage won't stop until we make them stop. Burdock House. Burdock House is an example of that. Former cap kids in their 20s, former Catholic workers, 
They buy an old warehouse for $25,000. They recon recondition it, refurbish it to have rooms. Um, in the backyard, they hold, it was, I found it quite moving. Uh, people, these kids trapped in these low wage, menial, uh, you know, deadening jobs, uh, come and read poetry. One of the guys I interviewed was quite a talented blues musician, was playing blues. And, and look, that, we have to get in touch with those non-rational forces that the technological society seeks to diminish or extinguish. What are those forces? Beauty, truth, grief, a search for meaning, the struggle with our own mortality. This is what makes a complete human being. And it's why the technocratic state makes war on the humanities and culture. And, and it, you know, the Buddhists say you, you can memorize as many sutras as you want, it will never make you wise. And we have to recover wisdom and the capacity for transcendence. The understanding that there are human lives and systems of life that have an intrinsic value beyond a monetary value. And that, and in, in, as Poyani says, that are sacred. And, and the society, that the consumer society, the technocratic society at its core has made war on the sacred. And our only hope is to recover it. Um, because it, it, it gives us a sense of self, our place in the universe, and most importantly, it connects us. And, and, and that atomization, that alienation, that anomie, that isolation is not only deadening to our souls and thrusting us into despair, but is an effective political technique to keep us captive. Last question. The messiness of democracy with all its paralysis and reverses keeps revolution alive and vibrant. Do you want to expound on that? Sure, because uh, this is uh, Karl Popper's understanding that in an open society, you have mechanisms by which piecemeal and incremental reform is possible. The New Deal. You have the collapse of capitalism. Roosevelt says, look, if the private sector can't create jobs, the government has to create jobs. He created 12 million jobs, Social Security. And when that capacity for um, change is becomes calcified, as it has become in our corporate state, then uh, you, you redirect. When you redirect all of the, the wealth and the systems of power to a cabal, in this case a corporate cabal, you leave behind uh, the majority of your population to fester and to express in very self-destructive ways the pathologies that I write about in this book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I fear is that this time around, when capitalism goes down, we won't have the Progressive Party, the old CIO, an independent press, uh, labor unions, you know, power wobblies. We won't have any of that. And, you know, in the 1930s, Europe went one way, Italy and Germany, Spain, and we went another. Uh, and and I, I just see, especially with the rhetoric uh, coming out of the White House and the rise of these Trump mini-me's in places like Florida, uh, you know, and, and the transformation of the Republican Party into a kind of uh, party built around a personality cult, um, I, uh, I worry that we will swing, we have the potential to swing to a kind of corporate-backed, Christianized fascism. On that hopeful note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank I you. Thank you for that. And if you have your books and would like to have them signed, they're going to be signed right back that away by the staff signs. So if you'll uh, give Chris just a moment for Andrew to get him over to that table where you'll be signed and then take your place in line to get your book signed. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>